Seth, would you like to start this week? Yeah, sure. That's good. All right. Uh, I don't even remember what I put on. Oh, yeah. So this is an interesting case. Uh, this is a case I had yesterday. Um, and I, you know, reading things in a vacuum. So this patient was sent to us um, with a history of chest pain and possible dissection. Actually kind of projects a little bit better here, but it, it's extremely interesting how um, you know, subtle some of the findings can be on. I mean, there's fluid surrounding the aorta, but that's not that uncommon from the recesses, but there's a little more circumferential than you would see given that the kind of lentiform shape of just the uh, posterior and anterior aspects of the superior pericardial recess. You shouldn't really see fluid around here too often. Plus there's kind of fluid around the right main pulmonary artery and there's some pericardial fluid, but you'd be surprised if I told you, you're looking at that and I told you that was, you know, 130 Hounsfield units, um, as it did measure even on our packs, you'd be surprised. Now this is the non-con, which is aggressive. But this is a non-contrast study on the mm. same patient showing how hyperdense this material is. Now the question is, well, you know, there is a type A intramural hematoma. Uh, there's clearly contrast or blood extending along, I'll tell you why I say contrast, blood or contrast extending along the shared sheath between the pulmonary arteries. There's blood in the various pericardial recesses. Here's the left pulmonary venous recess over here portions of the transverse sinus, portions of the oblique sinus over here, and then even some actually extending into the mediastinum. And it turns out this patient had a, uh, let me see if I can pull this up real quick, had a cath the other day, and during their cath, they were uh, blowing up a uh, balloon in the ostium of the um, they're blowing up a balloon in the ostium of the right coronary artery and noticed that they had a coronary dissection. Um, and But what they failed to notice is that, uh, or if they didn't mention, is that you can see that there's contrast here. They're injecting the right coronary artery after they stented the proximal RCA, RCA for this dissection, that you see this contrast pooling here and it doesn't go away and it's in the aorta. So this has to be in the wall of the aorta. I mean, it wouldn't just sit there. Um, so presumably an iatrogenic intramural injury slash dissection, there was no actual dissection flap. And the question is, well, is this blood or contrast? Um, and the answer is, I don't know. It's probably some blood and some contrast. She's in the operating room now. They had to take her anyways because she had severe two vessel disease um, and had to treat that. But, uh, you know, I, I found out the history about the cath and looked it up, and I'm guessing, again, I, I don't know, I, I just haven't seen even blood products be this bright. That's why I'm assuming, given that cath finding and the reading upper history, that probably some of this is just contrast injection, but some of it's probably blood. Um, anyways, interesting case. Very, yeah. Very interesting. This is, oh, this is just a nice example of why I um, am a very strong proponent of imaging the full field of view on cardiac studies, let alone calcium scores. Now, here, even though we do the majority of the reading, um, we do have cardiologists that read currently one day a week, and they are very upset that they have to look at the full chest. and. Um, but you know, that's just the way it is. And this is a calcium score and that that's the full, you know, the, that's just the, the calcium score, but here's the full field of view. Uh, and you can't see that. And that was a lung cancer and that was taken out and it hadn't spread, but you can imagine if this was a asymptomatic patient uh, and it was on the scout, but a nice example of a lung cancer that would have been missed had we just done the limited field of view on a uh, calcium score, which is what many of our other imaging colleagues that are not radiologists want. So just a nice example. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I think your point about the scout is that we do limited field here, but I always make it a point to look at the scout for that very reason. Yeah, you know, it was, I, I well, they, they tried to do that here, and I just, you know, that's the way they were doing it. I just put my foot down. I said, no, not not going to do it. I, I have to, for acquiring, and then the whole, you know, thing, well, T-spines, blah, 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 blah. But I, I just feel like, you know, if we're radiating it, we might as well look at it. Agreed. Um, and it's just something that I was able to change when I got here. So this is not a any sort of um, clinical uh, conundrum, but just a nice example of a, uh, oops, going pretty fast to see if I can slow this down. So this person has a known uh, lesion on her aortic valve. It's been there for years, surprisingly. They've been following it, which is shocking to me. She it, Because she refuses surgery, but you can see that there is this hypoattenuating uh, mass attached to the aortic valve. It, it almost appears frond-like as it is. I mean, there's very little in the differential diagnosis here. It's, it's either going to be um, a vegetation, which it doesn't look like, or very frond-like too, or a fibroblastoma. Um, and uh, she went to surgery and they took it out and it is a fibroblastoma. So other things to differentiate, there's no, the valve is not destroyed. Endocarditis destroys valves, thickens valves, really makes them look quite ugly. Um, so if you have a lesion on a valve and the valve otherwise looks pretty unremarkable, uh, it's a good choice. And there's no history that would suggest otherwise. I mean, people with endocarditis are usually also clinically very different. But uh, anyways, I'm surprised she didn't embolize and have some issues um, given the um, given how long that was on her valve. And this is just a, a nice case of, not nice, unfortunate, but she had metastatic, known metastatic disease of just making sure, you know, you look at everything, especially with renal cell. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see here that, I'm kind of highlighting it, but there's this little nugget here in the LV, I think pretty inconspicuous. I mean, I'm, I'm highlighting it, but if you're scrolling through a lot of studies, it's pretty small and it wasn't detected. It's fine. There's metastatic disease uh, kind of elsewhere. So not a huge clinical thing. And then this is what she looked like uh, about a month and a half later. Uh, again, not huge, but it definitely growing. Um, and just, uh, it, it's interesting. You know, we always say that, oh, metastatic disease is by far the most common cardiac tumor. And that is true pathologically. But I have to say, um, I see, personally, I see in clinical practice, a lot of primary tumors. Um, and, you know, little, at least deposits in the uh, myocardium with kind of myocardial metastasis, I, I just don't see that frequently, maybe a case or two a year. Um, I see more cases of uh, right-sided mets from stuff extending from veins into the chambers. But um, anyways, this was a very avidly enhancing growing nodule slash mass in the, I don't know how we denote sizes of lesions in the myocardium, but um, uh, just a met from RCC, uh, just kind of, even though it's not gated, you can see it. You got to just look at, got to look at the whole study. The heart's not excluded, even though we don't, it's not gated. So, uh, and those are my cases. Great. Great. All right. Cardiac special. Who would like to go next? I can go anytime, Jeff. All right. All right. <clears throat> Okay, let me show this one. We'll just do these in order. I think um, some time ago, Jeff may have asked whether any one of us had seen parenchymal cysts in a patient with CLL. Now, we've seen them in a variety of lymphoproliferative disorders. And I don't know if I had seen one, but here is a patient that, and I'll show you the history in a moment, that does have a history of CLL for a long time. And I'll show you a couple of cysts, and I think that they are related. So the biggest one is right there. And it's got little septations or little residual tissue in it. And let me see if I can find the others. There were a couple that 
I like that, but much smaller, like here. And here is one there, maybe one there. So I saw just a few of them. And really, that's it. So the history goes back to 2006. He does have a B cell CLL, as you can see there. So I think this is an example of cystic disease that's causally associated with the B cell lymphoproliferative disorder and protein deposition. Jeff, you did you did have a case, or I think you did have a case of CLL, right? Yes. And if okay. I remember, if, I can't remember if it was the cyst form after treatment, and that was what was left. But I, no, I think it was just the cyst. But there, you know, you, I saw. Um, Lots of lymphadenopathy, and it was long-standing, like your case. I presume it's a similar phenomenon. Yeah. Um, except right. it, it's a B, it's it's a more clonal B cell. So you also wonder if it's just if it arose from something else, or or just somehow they the protein obstructs the airways. Yep. Right. Uh, this is a really nice case that uh, Leif showed me the other day. So it's a really wonderful teaching case of hydrostatic lung edema, uh, particularly interstitial lung edema. And I do have a CT here, so the patient was in the ER. I'm not sure if they really evaluated the radiograph before they ordered a CT for pulmonary embolism, but that combination, as you know, is pretty common. So let me just show you the CT to show you a couple interesting things. Or oh, we had an opportunity to see some things really nicely. So let me go scroll through there, and you'll see, obviously, many, many septal lines. Um, the question is, how thick septal lines can get? And the answer is, they can get pretty thick. Now, we don't have septal lakes here, but we have very thick septal lines in the lower lung zones in particular. And this over here, in the left lower lung, I think David will like this, I think is a lot of edema in the intersegmental into sublobar septum. So it is a connective tissue structure, and I think we're seeing it right there. It's the right place for it, and I think it's just very edematous, just like the, the interlobular septa are very edematous. Um, the other thing that this case, I think, shows really nicely for teaching purposes is when you have a lot of edema in the connective tissue sheath surrounding the bronchus and the pulmonary artery. So here's a depiction uh, that I got from a book of edema in the bronchovascular connective tissue sheath, bronchus and pulmonary artery, that perhaps not surprisingly, when there's a lot of edema there, that these airways, the bronchus in particular, can get compressed. So here's sort of the idea of cardiac asthma. Patients who have edema can wheeze. And I think um, it's pretty dramatic, for example, looking right here, how narrow those bronchi are. So I think it's a really nice depiction of that phenomenon. Um, this shows really nicely as well if I go to the lateral projection, how nicely you can see and how thick you can get um, subpleural interstitial edema. So here's a really nice example of subpleural interstitial edema related to the interlobar fissures. And then again, very quickly, if we go to the mediastinal windows, I think we can all appreciate how much water is going along the bronchovascular sheets into the mediastinum. I think the nodes are all edematous. This is all water in the sheath, and perhaps even these nodes right up there are also waterlogged or edematous. So some really nice teaching features of lung edema on this CT. Okay. This is a really nice companion case to the one that Travis showed, I think it was last week or the week before, of the viral infection. Travis, was that, I don't know, I'm trying to remember, that you showed a really right. nice it was a metanumovirus last week. Oh, okay, metanumovirus. Well, here we go. So check this one out. So I think this one is a companion case to yours. Um, a really nice demonstration of the bronchitis, 
So all these bronchial walls are very thick. There are opacities in the lung adjacent to them. Um, not so much a bronchiola pattern, but a very striking and a really nice example of a viral bronchitis and then areas of consolidation as well. And sure enough, for your companion case, I couldn't remember. Here's it, another one, human metanumovirus. So here's the context. And PCR showed human metanumovirus. I think the findings are absolutely typical for a viral bronchopneumonia in this patient. So a really nice companion case to the one that you showed. Also human metanumovirus. Uh, this one is just an incidental finding. It's kind of a, a nice case to show what, presumably in this patient, chronic pulmonary thromboembolism as an incidental finding can look like. So the finding here is in relation to the left pulmonary artery. So if we, let me just go to the axials here quickly and show you the difference in opacification of the left lower lobe pulmonary artery. So, so far so good, but beyond this level, boom, that artery is gone. And there are no arteries there pretty much. We can see some bronchial collaterals feeding that area. And then we can see a nice black smoke phenomenon of slow flow of unopacified blood through the left lower lobe back to the atrium. So findings that I consider very typical of a manifestation of localized and presumably localized chronic pulmonary thromboembolism to the left lower lung. And then when I looked at the previous radiograph from 2016 and comparing the caliber of vessels in the right lower lung to these skimpy guys in the left lower lung, I was pretty confident that the finding was present in 2016 and must have occurred quite some time before then. So really nice imaging findings of what I interpret as chronic pulmonary thromboembolism involving the left lower lobe pulmonary vessels. All right, so, uh, those are my cases, uh, Jeff. What's on the evidence uh, around uh, about the right hilum in that lung? I think they're just calcifications there, David. Remote granulomatous infection up here. Got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's got to be it. Yep. Up there. Lots of calcium up there. Yep. All righty. All right. Anyone? I have two. I've got a quickie or two. Can people see a, a rentgenogram of high quality? Indeed. Okay, it's a snap. Okay, this person has an apical mass here on um, this chest radiograph, very smoothly, uh, very well defined, very smooth, abutting the uh, spine. So, looks like a neurogenic tumor to me. Heart size okay, uh, aorta looking good, everything like that. Notice that the trachea is a little bit uh, displaced here to the left. So, turns out. This is actually a little more complicated than I thought. So let's just find out what that apical thing is. It turns out it's really part of this very extensive contrast enhanced structure that goes way up into the neck and is displacing the trachea to the left. And then uh, arcs here to the left joins the subclavian artery over here and descends. So this is a cervical right aortic arch with aberrant left subclavian artery. And, um, you know, it's it's really hard, I think, to interpret this apical lesion here as anything other than a neurogenic tumor. I mean, I thought that was going to be a schwannoma or something like that. But lo and behold, the aortic arch is way up here off the field of view of this um, chest CT. And this person that had, you notice that there, perhaps that there was uh, some rib deformity over here. This was a result of thoracotomy when the patient was only two years old because they tied off a PDA. This person has another cardiac uh, abnormality of a bicuspid aortic valve, but 
uh, insignificant gradient. And it turns out this is all part of de George syndrome. <laughs> so ruddy aortic arch, aberrant, right cervical aortic arch with aberrant left subclavian artery. Uh, in PDA in the past, everything descends here on the left. This looks like a normal aortic arch in this location here. So I would have been fooled every time into thinking this was a normal left aortic arch. I think the only thing that, that really points to right aortic arch is the deviation of the trachea. The trachea is much better at, than the chest radiograph at telling you where the aortic arch is. So the displacement of the trachea, in this case, I think is the best hint that there's a right aortic arch and it's way up there, so it's a cervical right aortic arch. David, so wouldn't, I, wouldn't you call this a circumflex cervical right aortic arch since it, the hmm. arch, it crosses midline and descends on the contralateral side? That would be fine with me, yes. Did we use this case in our right aortic arch paper? It looks very familiar. I, it must be an old one. Maybe I saw it when I was a resident. Uh, it is an old one. I don't know that uh, that we've used it before, but um, I, this was, <clears throat> I think this case was from 2010. I think. Uh, oh, no, not old enough then. Right. Okay. All right. So let me show you this. Um, this guy here has had a heart transplant and had this chest radiograph uh, a couple of years ago. This shows that this baseline lung stuff. He's got a little bit of adelectious sort of scar over here. Um, and then he's got this fragment here of defibrillator that was left behind when they transplanted his heart. And his current radiograph is looking a lot busier. It looks to me as if there are some nodules now on his current chest radiograph. And there's this big consolidation of the right base and pleural effusion. And this is what his uh, CT looks like currently. Um, he's got a lot of small airways disease here, particularly in upper lungs. But he's got this, um, then he's got some stuff in the bases down here. But it's mostly upper lung stuff. It's mostly associated with small airways. It's trying to be tree and bud in some regions. And it turns out that this is, uh, when he's bron bronchoscoped, it, this was loaded with aspergillus. So how do you get airways dissemination of aspergillus? <clears throat> By smoking marijuana naturally. And that's exactly what was going on here. So this fellow was an avid user of marijuana. I think he smoked every day. And they, they measure marijuana consumption in grams. I don't remember how many grams he has. But this is a typical pattern of aspergillosis associated with marijuana smoking, where it really becomes an airways, a, a bronchitis, bronchiolitis sort of pattern, typically worse in upper lungs, and is spilling into the bases as well. So marijuana, um, it's really important now that marijuana is legal to ask people specifically about their use of it, because now that it's legal, people don't even think of it, and they don't think of it as a uh, as a medication, they don't, they're don't they not aware of the risks. Definitely, you don't want to be doing this if you're a transplant person because uh, this could easily become more invasive uh, when you have a lot of aspergillus in your lung and you're immune compromised. So aspergillus um, bronchiolitis here, bronchitis bronchiolitis from marijuana. So, so, so that's an infectious what? bronchiolitis? In, that's, this is an infectious aspergillus bronchiolitis in this case? Yes, I think so, okay. just by, by the pattern. And sure. he, was symptomatic. he was symptomatic, he was coughing and everything, so. Hmm. Okay, it's natural, but not everything natural is good for you. Um, so the interesting please. question, David, is, and this, you, we may figure this out in a few years, is, is the method of delivery, you know, affect how, what organisms can get into the lungs? Because sometimes, you know, people right. smoke, smoke um, a joint sometimes they use a, a bong or something where there's a water filter uh, and who knows what else other that's right va vaping right and even uh dabbing which well, i showed you guys a case of dabbing a while ago where they they put the marijuana resin the oil that they've extracted with butane or something like that onto a red hot piece of metal and generate a, a burst of smoke and then inhale that so that causes a different different kind of marijuana. Now, I, I don't know, I, I haven't seen infection associated with that. I think the high temperatures there probably uh, would keep you from getting much in the way of infection. 
but you can get a lot of bronchial irritation from the smoke and everything else. Excellent. So we've got at least three or four different patterns now of lung disease from marijuana. Yes. You know, either, you know, the, the case I showed last week, which was more of an, of an acute hypersensitivity looking case with a very ill-defined central lobular nodules. You know, the cases that I saw at Emory and that I think David and Howard have shown more examples of where it was more of a lung injury with more discrete central lobular nodules, but still diffuse. And now this, which clearly looks infectious. Right. So uh, maybe we should have maybe we should have another RSNA project here of um, you know aspergillus in the uh, marijuana age, you know the legalized marijuana age or something like that, because we're probably seeing a lot more stuff now than we used to. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Travis is going to try to hopefully. It sounds like your connection's good. Travis, I don't think we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So this is a guy in his 50s who I have his, unfortunately I don't have his old CT here, but had a CT a year ago, head and neck cancer, which he didn't have metastatic disease, but he had a left superior partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. Then he came to the ED, he had been lost to follow, came to the ED last month with upper extremity, face swelling, and plethora. And you can see that he has this large right mediastinal mass. And it's, I mean, this is really impressive. But it's causing superior vena cava syndrome. And this is all metastatic disease from his head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. And you can see the narrowing of the right-sided bronchi as well. And the, the SVC looks like it's obliterated. But what's really interesting is the fact that what we see with his left PAPVR in his left upper lobe. So now that he was injected through his left upper extremity, the superior vena cava and the left innominate vein are both obliterated here. So look where the contrast is going. At least part of it is decompressing. There's some in the collaterals in the chest wall and elsewhere. But it decompressed retrograde and, and injected retrograde into the pulmonary veins. And, you know, it's a very interesting network of collaterals here that then you know, have developed, and some of this gets into, there's clearly a macroscopic communication with the pulmonary arteries from the, from this anomalous pulmonary vein, and then some of it, I think, just ends up, I don't know, in, in the communicating with the left superior pulmonary vein, and somehow ended up in the left inferior pulmonary vein and making its way back to the left atrium that way. So it's a really curious case of, you know, just this collateral pathway that's been developed and then probably affected by forceful injection. You know, what's interesting here, and this is one of those examples where I actually wish we had delayed imaging, because this you know, certainly looks like it could be a pulmonary embolism. I guess My guess is it's probably just collateral flow and smoke from the fact that we have nothing in the pulmonary arteries. This is one where I actually wanted them to get a delayed sequence on when we saw this, but I guess the patient, they weren't really worried about pulmonary embolism, so they chalked it up to, to you know, just incomplete opacification here. But I've never seen this phenomenon before in a patient with partial anomalous pulmonary venous return, where the SVC then became obstructed and we had the retrograde filling, as in this case. So... Veins, veins are for me. Yeah, I think you're right. So some of it ends up in, I don't, but I guess some of it's just an astomosis with the pulmonary artery or left inferior pulmonary vein and then returns to the left heart that way. So of course the question was then raised, what's the best way to do a PE study if it were to be done? I would say inject through the lower extremity since the IVC is not you know, involved or just do uh, a delayed phase to see this filling into the pulmonary artery. But it's kind of like, it's not like this patient almost created his own Glen shunt with this. So, oh. uh, just another interesting flow related mm -hmm. case. 
And then I can't even remember which one was the other one I was going to show. Oh, this one. This is an interesting, it's cute radiograph. So you can see on the PA view, we've seen some of these. I think it's a good radiograph, though. This is a patient who, I think the first thing you notice is that there's volume loss on the right side. The right hemidiaphragm is a little elevated. Right lung looks a little bit more loosened. And he has had prior lung surgery. But then there's this curious little lucency right in here. And when you look on the lateral view, you can see that this portion of lung seems to be jutting out anteriorly. And sure enough, on the CT, this is a patient who has severe emphysema. You can see he's had prior surgery here on the right. And this is just another example of one of these large hernias that we've seen before. And this is, Howard, I think you've showed the most recent one or one of them where the lung kind of looked like this this too, where you had like what looked like little reticulation and scar yeah. in the affected yeah. lung. Right. And this, this looks, you know, nearly identical. And this, you know, the pulmonologist said on exam that this is very dynamic as he breathes. But this is, you know, presumably at the site of his prior thoracotomy, where he has just this chronic dehiscence and loss of, you know, now he has this lax chest wall and the, the lung herniating out through here. So he's not symptomatic and from but other than it's just this you know, fluctuating lump on his chest. It's a bit funny because the usual thoracotomy is a little more posterior. Yes. Yeah. It's a bit odd. But it's yeah, they said this is where his scar is, though. So it's, oh, yeah, it was a weird one, I agree. Yeah, and this was done quite a while ago, so somewhere else. OK. But I thought it was yeah. an interesting case. Oh, very a nice very example of this. And just whatever this scar is, whether it's just from, you know, actual mechanical stress as the lung herniates in and out of here, whether it's a little bit of just edema, I don't know. But this this is what these tend to look like as we've seen before. Travis, it uh, looks like the it looks like the paraspinal uh, scarring that you get from a big osteophyte, you know, in the in the right lower yeah. lobe with lung just rubbing over that, you know, with every breath. That's a good point. You're right. It looks exactly like those little osteophyte scars. We we had a case several years ago in a lung transplant recipient that had a hernia like this, and what it developed were two little cavitary lesions near the, inside the, the 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 rib at the deformity, and so they appeared. So we had because we hadn't CT them in a while, we were worried about infection because there was a bunch of junk around it. Um, and they bronked them and everything, couldn't find anything. And then on follow-up imaging, they were exactly the same. And we then we, we, we thought about it some more and came up with the conclusion that it indeed was just related to mechanical. But it, we did have, and then like the scar though, I don't know what the cause of the cysts, if it was from injured airway or something. But at now I've seen this quite a bit. We see this quite a bit in our lung transplants, the um, lung transplant recipients for whatever reason, um, probably because they're all thoracotomies instead of VATs. And um, I've seen a bunch of stuff, consolidated lung, reticulation, cystic stuff. Um, and it always forms right around that, that rib end, the anterior and medial aspects of the rib end. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, that's, that's it for this week for me, Jeff. All right. Let's see. Well, we got, I've got some to show. All right. So this is one I sent to some of you a while ago, a couple weeks ago, but I wanted to share it with anyone who hadn't seen it. So, uh, not this one, sorry. Get the right one here. Yeah, here we go. So this was just instantly detected and um, this was a patient, uh, was a kidney transplant patient, or a patient with renal failure, that's right. And just had this remarkable calcification in the heart. And you can see some along the mitral annulus, which is not not as bad as we see in other patients, but most of it is along the, the papillary muscle apparatus, sort of the chordae tendon and the papillary muscles. You can see the two papillary muscles. And if you window it really down, you can see that there's milk or calcium in it. So this is mm. like a tumefactive, or whatever you want to call it, milk of calcium degeneration of these. The patient did have an echo. and. I don't think, if I recall, there wasn't much in the way of valvular disease. So, um, and I, I guess the renal failure at some point had something to do with calcium deposition here. But you know, we occasionally see punctate calcification in papillary muscles, but this is the first time I had seen 
uh, really this extensive calcium in the mitral apparatus. Um, and I think Seth had said, said he'd seen it as well. So just a nice example of that. What, what was Seth's uh, comment about? To, to, he called it tumefactive or something like that? or Yes, which I sometimes use to describe it in the mitral annulus if it's really large and it gets that milk of calcium a lot. Yeah, they, they call it caseous necrosis of the mitral annular complex. Um, okay, so this is an interesting case. Uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning. So this is a patient who has an adenocarcinoma of the colon and started with metastases. You can see, I'll just switch over lung windows real quickly, a smoker and then has what looked like, if you saw any one of these individuals, you caught a lung primary. Uh, it's got that sort of lobulated, uh, irregular. It's got some of the cystic change in it, which you can see with um, adenocarcinomas. Now, I went to the original path. They didn't specify if it was a mucinous tumor or not, um, but it was it was a KRAS positive adenocarcinoma of the colon. I mean, it had all the features. And there was some lymph node enlargement at that time as well. Um, now, this was a contrasted study, but you'll notice the lymph nodes are just typical density, and some of these may be enhancing a little bit. But what I thought was kind of interesting uh, is if we look at some subsequent follow-ups, you can see uh, the, the liver mets have calcified, but also we're starting to see calcium forming in the lung mets. Now, the patient received treatment, and the mets are slowly growing, but um, you know, we're, we're now two years later. So even though it was a stage four cancer, was have some benefit of therapy. But we started to see these calcifications in the lymph nodes that had tumor as well as in the lung metastases. And I'll show you one node in particular that just sticks out. This prevascular node here, you can see that has some calcium in it, didn't up front. And then the latest study, as the Mets continue to grow, we're seeing more and more calcium in these, in these metastases. Let me put them up side by side. But um, you know, we've seen this in several GI and GU cancers, particularly uh, ovary and, and colon. Uh, more often when they're mucinous, but not always. And sometimes it's treatment effect, but I think in some of these, it's actually real calcification from the tumor. And given that these are growing, I suspect that some of this is just tumefactive as well, or tumor type calcium. So this was the original, and you can see we're starting to develop this, this calcium here. So I, I'm sure you've seen this as well, but uh, we had one case here of a lymph node that was getting denser, and it was actually a metastasis from an ovarian tumor and not uh, granulomatous. We just see so many calcified lymph nodes, pretty much everybody, that uh, we have to remember that sometimes tumors do this. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so this is uh, kind of a twofer case. Um, so this is a patient who is about less than a year out from an allogeneic stem cell transplant for leukemia and has known graft versus host disease. And we can see on his radiograph, this is back in um, about six weeks ago, he has this, these peripheral areas of consolidation, maybe a little bit of reticular abnormality. Um, so you'd wonder about infection, but this had been brewing for some time and uh, CT was done um, shortly thereafter and has a nice appearance for an organizing pneumonia pattern of lung injury. We got this non-segmental peripheral areas of consolidation. Um, there is a little bit of reticulation, nice sort of trying to be an atoll here or some arcading if you like. Now there's this dense area of consolidation, but notice the airways are dilated and um, distorted a little bit. And again, multiple areas like this, there's a nice little atoll down here. So this is a good look for organized pneumonia and it would be consistent with graft versus host disease as a manifestation. Now he presented uh, a week ago with worsening dyspnea. And I'll put the two radiographs up and you can appreciate that some of the consolidation is getting denser, but there's also sort of this background abnormality that's developed more centrally, sort of a haziness. Uh, so you'd suspect either micronodules or ground glass opacity or something like that. But he was requiring more oxygen. His GVHD was not under control, but hadn't really flared all that much. Um, and so he got a CT scan to further show the findings. I, I think I only have the coronals on this particular slice. But you can see there's all this new ground glass. Here's the old one for comparison. I can't find the sep series. Of sep <laughs> but there's all this new ground glass. And the differential is not huge. Um, we raised the question of pneumocystis. 
but also just acute GVHD, sort of on a subacute GVHD. He wasn't on any new medication, so drug toxicity was probably not likely. You know, he's at 280 or so days out, you're mostly immune reconstituted, at least your, your uh, T cells and your neutrophils, um, B cells may be lagging a little bit, but he was mostly re-engrafted. Um, hemorrhage, probably not, given that it, the history didn't quite fit. He wasn't any more anemic than usual. Um, and they ended up doing a bronc on him and they sent off a bunch of stuff and he required more and more oxygen and uh, he didn't respond to diuresis. So this, we, we presume this was going to be acute GVHD and um, he uh, ultimately went to uh, comfort measures and died shortly thereafter because he wasn't responding and um, was, it was about in the 70s. But it, later on, it turned out the PCR for the pneumocystis was positive. So, um, you know, we don't see a lot of pneumocystis in marrow transplant or, or stem cell transplants anymore. They're almost all on prophylaxis. I believe he was on, I want to say he had been on some or at least pentamidine, but pentamidine is not quite as good as, as a sulfa. So um, it, you can still see it even if they're on prophylaxis. And with GVHD, there may be problems with absorption of some of these drugs if it's, if it's an oral drug. So uh, anytime I see ground glass in, a, in immunocompromised patients, I always put pneumocystis in my differential. Hmm. Interesting. All right. This is something that is an interesting case. So this is a lady who had a motorcycle crash about oh, a year and a half or so ago, had a bunch of complications, ended up getting an IBC filter, which um, was was left in for whatever reason. I don't know all the story, but... Uh, she was developing some pain that was thought to be related to her musculoskeletal and probably still is, but this was ordered to look for fractured struts of her IVC filter. They had seen on an abdominal scan that her IVC wasn't quite, the filter struts were missing. And so um, this was one of the ones where you know what you're looking for. Um, and we found a couple of them. And there's one you can see here in the middle lobe. There's one in the pulmonary artery and the right lower lobe, and that's not terribly exciting. The reason I'm showing this, though, is because they said they were missing two, but uh, I went to the trusty NIPS, and I found one more. And it's this guy right here that was lodged in the pulmonary artery. And if you follow it down, it actually goes in the right ventricular outflow tract and into the interventricular septum, just kind of right below the, the uh, aortic root, uh, sort of the very high septum. So it had worked its way down and put on a coronal. And so that's a place I have not seen one is lodged in the main pulmonary artery extending into the myocardium right here. So they're going to leave him alone. And um, she has one in her, her liver. It eroded into the aorta and embolized into the hepatic artery. So these are these have been problematic for some time. And I know there's a bunch of class action lawsuits going on against some of the manufacturers and, and such. But I'm not personally, I'm not a big fan of filters. I'm not really convinced they what they need to do and we see we've seen cases before of them embolizing into the lungs wow all right and here's a nice companion case for uh howard's case um this was a pe study and uh, we didn't see what we thought was acute pe but we saw this big blob in the left pulmonary artery and there's you'll notice the the branch pulmonary arteries are quite dilated and there's this high attenuation material, uh, probably contrast, could be calcium, in the left main. And then you'll notice there's this irregular bump in the right main pulmonary artery, like a sand dune or something. But it's very, it's along the wall. And I got the sense there's too much soft tissue even out peripherally, but more than just your usual lymphatic tissue. And then uh, you can see there's clearly uh, dilated um, vessels and more eccentric filling defects. So this is another example of chronic pulmonary thromboembolism, and we didn't see anything acute. Now, the RV is not that dilated. There's really no hypertrophy, so presumably it has not caused pulmonary hypertension, but um, could at some point if there's enough of it. But I've not seen one sort of kind of tumefactic would be, I guess, the word here. And I've seen eccentric clots, but I don't know. Has anybody ever seen one this blobby? Strange. I wonder if there's ingrowth of little blood vessels into it, and there's contrast medium enhancing that. That's what I thing. thought, that there was recanalization of it somehow, or, or it, it recruited some, something from the basal vasorum. 
So, Jeff, wow. these bears are awfully dilated. Did this person have a left to right shunt that led to hugeness of pulmonary arteries? Not that we were aware of. You know, when pulmonary arteries get to be this big, you kind of wonder if you're seeing in situ thrombosis. Right. Because of right. sluggishness, sluggish flow when the caliber is that big. Right. Well, we didn't, we weren't aware of any anything. And, you know, it's, I agree. Uh, what about the, what, yeah. Never mind. What about the lung? How do the lungs look? A little bit of heterogeneity. Um, you can see there's clearly vessel discrepancy size, but you don't get the, there's some areas of decreased perfusion. And if I were actually, I think that that segment down there may have been out. If I remember, it's been a while since I looked at this case, but yeah, there's, there's no really anterior base. You don't really see much of an artery coming down this way. And I think, I can't remember if there's another segment out up top. But yeah, not 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 as um, bad as you see. With I've seen pa patients with CTEF who actually have pulmonary hypertension have a lot more heterogeneity of their lungs, probably because we're missing or not seeing the microemboli or microthrombi. Mm -hmm. And this person did have pulmonary hypertension. Not as far as we know. Really? Yeah. And if you look at the, I mean, they may have some mild pulmonary hypertension, but there's. Not there's no right heart enlargement. There's no hypertrophy. So if it is, it's very mild or short, it hasn't been there that long. Hmm. I mean, the, the, main, the main pulmonary artery wasn't that impressive either compared to the branch pulmonary arteries. Right. Yeah, it, it looks normal. Oh, I wonder if this is some pulmonary aneurysm, artery aneurysm condition. I mean. Um, it, it, it could be, um, you know, you think with, with aneurysms and in situ thrombus, you think of Bechet's, but that's men and doesn't fit uh, clin with the patient's clinical presentation. And then you could think about, you can get congenital aneurysms, but to have bilateral would be unusual. And usually they're isolation and the valve is normal as far as we know. That's why I showed it because it was kind of an odd case and I've just not seen that block. A lot of muscle wasting too. She's got almost no chest wall or paraspinal yeah. muscular. It was an older patient, so okay. Yeah, probably not very active. All right. Well, that is what I have this week. Excellent. We have a few more minutes if okay. anyone has additional cases, or we can just wait till next week. Uh, let me see. Yep, next week will be good. Okay. Well, talk to everybody then. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.